strong and um, and I think we provide the best care in terms of um, analyzing their gait, normalizing it, um, understanding the, um, the reasoning behind why they walk the way they do. And, um, and that's very important because you, you walk kind of funny, you, you compensate by using back muscles, you know, and, and then you use shoulder muscles because, and then everything kind of, you know, falls apart. Do an EMG on a lot of the folks, and people often ask me why, and it's, it's not because I'm interested in what's going on in a, a limb that has obvious polio. I mean, there's, there's nothing to be gained from that. What we're really interested in are the limbs that appear to be unaffected. And the reason that I'm so interested in that is because I want to find out, does the person have any normal limbs? And if they are, then those are the limbs you use for exercise, because we, we try to find an exercise program for everybody. Your, your body constantly has an immune system on patrol. There are cells, macrophages and other cells, whose sole function is to march around your body looking for inflammation that shouldn't be there, or causes of inflammation, um, foreign particles, foreign bodies, viruses, bacteria, molds, fungi, things like this, things that shouldn't be in your body. So their sole job is to spot them and set up the alarm. So, okay, so we'll go back to these two people who have little bits of virus left in them, the vi poliovirus fragments, get out, macrophage sees it, sets up an alarm, says, whoa, poliovirus, send in the troops. So the whole immune system can be mobilized, entirely or partly, to combat this, what is perceived to be an infection. Of course, it's not an infection. And as soon as the troops arrive, they go, whoa, well, there's nobody here, because there's one little tiny fragment, and the first guy saw it and got rid of it. So there's nobody there. So now what? Okay, nobody here. What do we do? Well, we stand down and the virus, uh, the um, immune system slowly turns itself off, or not off, but lowers its level of, of uh, activity, and the inflammation subsides until the next time that one is released. Now, we don't know at what rate they're released, but we can speculate that they could be released at a reasonably regular interval, which would keep the body in a constant state of subacute but chronic inflammation. That's the nutshell of how you could get a, a subacute chronic inflammation from the polio virus. Now, the really nasty thing is, of course, you can get it from a hundred other things as well. And it isn't just one thing. And so with, for PPS, it seems to me that the idea here is to lower your level of inflammation. That's the key factor. How much of the mood changes relate to brain damage from polio? How much of it is post-polio syndrome, as opposed to people grappling with a significant and progressive disability, where anybody would get depressed, have mood changes, which would then affect their overall functioning? Um, I think the impact of the post-polio physiology on mood-related centers, again, has not been fully explored. Um, it is suspected that with the immune theory of post-polio, which is certainly a component of post-polio syndrome, that some of the immune chemicals, um, the cytokines that are being you know, released and you know, causing you know, fatigue can also contribute to depression. Um, it's been seen in the MS community you know, where cytokines are also actively involved. Um, so I think there could be a basic pathophysiology that makes people at greater risk to develop mood-related problems. I think that every characteristic that anyone can look at that they see as a, um, uh, an asset in their personality can, can also, in another situation, uh, be a problem. And so that same kind of mentality makes it a bit difficult for some of these individuals to follow through, for example, on um, uh, on, on doing some uh, peaceful relaxation before getting into bed. Um, you know, they're go, 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 sleep, get up, go, 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 go. And, and that just, that, and that might work through one's younger years, but, but when you start to get older and start to develop um, other issues, and then it's the sleep that starts to get eaten away. And so um, uh, that's a basic part of sleep hygiene is really going to bed in a relaxed, peaceful state. Um, and that's, that's kind of hard for some of these individuals to do, to kind of back up and, and, uh, and relax. Listening doesn't work 
if showing them here you went out shopping all day, the next day you spent it in bed. Is, is this a, a helpful pattern for you? And some people are willing to accept the fact that they can go out and do everything they need to do on one day and spend the rest of the week in bed, and they're comfortable with that. Um, unfortunately, it's hard to convince somebody that they could be adding neuromuscular damage by doing that um, because they, they, it may take months or a couple of years for them to see that, gosh, I am weaker and now I can't do that anymore physically. Not that you know, I'm trying to avoid pain and fatigue, but I physically can't do it and potentially my overuse is behind that. So it's kind of like you know, after the fact they realize, oh, I shouldn't have been doing that and then it may be a little too late. So, you know, people came to us after undergoing tests that were unnecessary, surgeries sometimes that may not have been necessary, um, and by the time they found us, they were so frustrated but also so incredibly relieved to know from the first phone call that they had found a clinic that really understands polio. And the other interest is with uh, osteoporosis and the disuse and the affected limb and also teaching the people doing the bone density scans that they need to do the affected side and not just do what the protocol is. Uh, even at a large facility like we have at Mass General Hospital in Boston, which is a world-renowned facility, I had a fight with them to tell them that, no, you have to do the side that I asked, not the side that's the protocol. And I spoke to the director there, uh, Dr. Slovic, who understood that and after we repeated some studies and they saw that the unaffected side was normal and the affected side was abnormal. You know, the, the thing that, that makes me nuts too is, um, you know, you said in Melbourne um, you, they'll interview the, uh, um, the health officials or the school officials and they'll say, oh well we, we have 93 percent uh, coverage in yeah. school or uh, New York City has 96 percent coverage in school. Well that sounds really good. The United States has about 91% coverage of children, of infants and toddlers, up to 36 months. 90% coverage. Sounds good. That leaves 1 million infants and toddlers unvaccinated against polio. Here we're sitting in New Jersey, New York City's across the river. There are more than 50,000 infants and toddlers in New York and New Jersey unvaccinated against polio. So our friend from Pakistan lands at Newark Airport, lands at JFK, goes and visits their 18-month-old cousin who may be poor and mm. is, has not been vaccinated, mm. and all of a sudden there's a dozen cases of paralytic polio. There are things that they could use and probably need, but they're reluctant to use them because they've always been on their own. They might be struggling up the steps, but I've done this, I can do this, you know. I don't want to be crippled, you know, so on. They, they don't recognize that using things that are pretty much readily available through government funding or private funding, people have worked on the life they have so will make their life so much easier. They will enjoy it so much more. But they're reluctant because they remember from childhood they had to wear a brace. As soon as they were old enough to make the decision, I'm not going to wear that brace anymore, and they chuck it. But now they're getting weaker and their leg joints are breaking down because their gait is all crooked and they can use a brace or they can use a wheelchair or a scooter or something to assist. 